my wife and I are down here investigating area around the Jenny Hill today. As you can see, it's some pretty thick stuff. Oh, it just goes on forever. So we'll get to a spot where we can uh, sit down and, and I'm going to read y'all a couple inhumanoid stories. And if you like the video, be sure and hit the like button and subscribe. And I'll leave a link for uh, anyone who wants to purchase books or anything like that. I'll leave a link in the description for you. So, okay, let's see what we can do. Hello everybody, uh, thanks for stopping in again to our channel. Um, today we're going to talk about Dogman a little, the beast of LBL. A lot of my friends don't believe that Dogman exists. A lot of my friends that believe in Bigfoot don't believe that Dogman exists. But I promise you they're wrong. They do exist. What they are is a matter of speculation, but they do exist. So. No, I'm sure everyone's heard of the Beast of LBL and uh, the alleged murders that took place there back in the 1980s. But I realize not everyone has read the original tale, which I put in my first book, uh, Mysterious Kentucky, Volume 1, uh, relating to Jan Thompson's account. So there's been some confusion as to what she said in the original story was. So when I interviewed her in 2007, uh, for the Hunt the Dogman documentary. I made sure all the, the descriptions and details that she'd give me uh, and I previously published in my book were correct. And so I'm going to read you her account in her own words so everyone will know exactly what Jan Thompson said about this uh, alleged murder, family murder. I believe it was around the beginning of May, just before the tourist season would start on Memorial Day. When the following event occurred. I must make note here that this story was never published in the paper or on the news, nor did it have any media attention at all, as the witnesses to the facts were contacted shortly after the incident and strictly instructed not to repeat anything they saw, share any information, or disclose where the actual location was. A few particular individuals said in letter, later interviews that some high-ranking government officials threatened to take away their jobs and pensions if they ever disclosed any aspect of this particular case. So for nearly two decades, most of the people that were involved kept silent. Two local police officers, I'll name them Adam and Bill to protect their identities, came in while I was on duty at the same service station. They usually came by during the night, got coffee and a snack, chatted a bit, and then left. But on this particular night, I soon discovered, 
They had just come from a crime scene in LBL and had been there for over eight hours. It was around three in the morning and they both appeared particularly shaken, pale, and acting curiously bewildered. Adam sat on the curb next to some gas pumps, expelling his stomach contents, while his partner, Bill, came in to get coffee for himself and water for Adam. Being a slow night, I went outside with Bill to see if I could offer some assistance. Fifteen minutes of hushed silence passed, except for the occasional dry heaving sounds from Adam. They both appeared in a disoriented, disorientated stupor, and it was Adam who spoke first. I can't believe it. It's not possible. I just can't believe it, he said. The conversation that followed was in broken sentences at first, but ever so slowly, fragmented descriptions of their recent ordeal were revealed. Finally, it was Bill himself who divulged the whole frightening account. They had gotten a call to help with an investigation at one of the many rural campgrounds down in LBL. Several types of law enforcement were already there, state troopers, sheriffs, deputies, etc. when they arrived after sundown. Also present were several coroners, each from different counties. A young married couple that was camping in the area had discovered the scene and reported it to authorities from a payphone in Grand Rivers. They had only given directions to the crime scene and their names, the officer said. They had flat out refused to return to the LBL area. A motor home was discovered with one of its doors hanging by one hinge, along with bloody handprints along the meadow outside walls. Ripped and bloody clothing and the remains of three bodies were also found on the property. The gouging wounds found in what remained of the bodies were made by thick long claws and the deep teeth and bite marks were made from long incisors along with a large snout according to one of the first examining coroners. The rake marks in the flesh were made up of four distinctive long strokes with an additional smaller digit stroke like that from a thumb and the span was much wider than that of a man's handprint. The theories that a bear, wolf, mountain lion, or coyote could have done the damage were dismissed as the injuries were clearly made by much larger animals. Bears are not native to the area. Along with all the evidence collected, there was also found a clump of long gray and brown hairs in the hand of one of the victims. From the clothing that was examined inside the camper, the authorities presumed that the victims had been a family consisting of a father, mother, a young boy, and a young girl that there was one body missing, that of the little girl. It was Adam that inadvertently discovered her, up high dangling from a tree positioned on a limb. Parts of her body had been leisurely eaten. Some of the same long gray and brown hairs were found sticking in the bark of the tree near her body. About a month after this incident, Adam and Bill stopped by during one of the mid midnight shifts I was working. They seemed to have aged quite a bit with streaks of gray in their hair and beards which had not been there before. Their faces showed signs of stress. They told me in confidence that they got word that the test results from the hair samples and saliva taken from the bite marks came back with an unknown origin of species and that the closest animal they compared them to was that of a canis lupus, a wolf. So all these people going around saying that she said, that Jan said that the officer's hair turned white and all that. And it's not true. So just what are these things? No one can say for sure. Theories are plentiful and varied as the people who posit them. Some claim they are flesh and blood animals. Others think they are some type of genetically engineered hybrid between the more common Bigfoot creatures and dogs. The creations of either our own demented government factions or extraterrestrial beings from the Pleiades cluster. Some even feel the creatures are demons straight from hell. While it is beyond the scope of this work to attempt to offer vindication of any of these theories, I think it is a safe bet that all dogman reports are not the result of disingenuous eyewitnesses and hoaxers. So that's what Jan Thompson wrote. That's all she wrote. Uh, that's all she gave me until I interviewed her a year or two later for the Hunt the Dogman documentary. What, whether this story is true or not, who knows? I don't know. Um, only Jan and God knows the answer to that, and Jan passed away uh, a couple of years ago. So you would you'd love to think that if these things were a physical flesh and blood type animal that they would have to eat and drink and breed in order to uh, stay uh, alive or keep themselves from extinction. So they have very little 
testimony regarding uh, such things as dogman families. Uh, but now uh, we have we do have one we do have one account and it was from uh, it was shared to me 20 years ago by Miss Linda Godfrey. Uh, she's been a great friend of mine for at least 20 years and she gave me permission to share that story. And I'm getting ready to do that as soon as I change positions here. So let's change positions and get out of this sun. Sorry about that, everyone. We had to change locations. That the sun was really hot there on that swamp, that cypress swamp behind me. So we come over here in the shade, and I was getting ready to talk about dogman families. Okay, here's another report that my friend Linda shared with me. Which I wrote about in uh, Mysterious Kentucky Volume 2. Okay, here we go. Aside from the supernatural transformations of evil wizards and the unwittingly accursed, could there be a more physical, more rational explanation for at least some of these dogman sightings? Because as you know, just as with Bigfoot, there's a huge debate going on where they're flesh and blood creatures or supernatural creatures. and I think they're a little bit of both, uh, but here we go. Is it possible some of them could be uh, merely a different undiscovered type of canid that has developed a propensity for bipedal ambulation? If there really are fresh flesh and blood, natural canines, then it might be safe to assume that they act as all other canines, producing offspring and living in family units or packs, just as feral dogs do today. Yet only one instance of a possible dogman family unit sighting has ever surfaced to my knowledge, and wouldn't you know it, it happened in Kentucky. Another Kentuckian, this one from Livingston County, Livingston County, contacted Linda about an incident of which he had never spoken to anyone before that occurred in the land between the lakes in 2002. A group of us had gone up there for the weekend, he wrote. I don't know if the rest of the group encountered the animals or not, I never mentioned it to them for fear of being teased. We had all driven up to the campsite separately because we all lived in different towns. After the trip was over, they all packed their trucks up and left, leaving the witness behind to make sure the campsite was in order. It was dark by the time I left the campsite, he said. I took the long way home, going north along the Trace Road. This area is very dangerous at night due to the large amount of wildlife in the area. I was only going about 25 miles per hour. The witness didn't notice a group of deer run across the road, so he turned on his off-road lights to see if he could spot what was chasing them. He saw nothing, however, so he turned the lights back off and proceeded onward. After a few more seconds, he saw, saw another group of deer, this time standing in the road and forcing him to come to a complete stop. The deer turned and ran off after about 15 seconds. After seeing this, he decided to turn the off-road lights back on, and since there was no other traffic on the road, Drive, drive with them on until we hit the interstate. I hit the switch to turn on my lights and caught a glimpse of what I first thought was a rather large coyote, he said, until I realized that it was running on its hind legs, just barely running with its front paws. I decided to pull up to where I saw it cross. With the amount of light my truck was giving off, I could see a large area around me. I scanned the trees and grass to see if, it, if I could see the animal again. And he did see it again. He could see something moving back and forth in the tall grass but couldn't make out very clearly at first. It was slowly edging closer to the vehicle. Soon it was close enough for the witness to see its grayish black fur and snout. At this point something even stranger happened. The three smaller animals ran out in front of my truck the same way as the first one did. I decided to turn my truck and aim my lights at the area and could see something standing in the grass around six and a half feet tall maybe and three smaller ones walking back and forth near it. He shut the engine off and rolled down the window to see if he could hear anything. According to him, the creatures were making sounds that he described as similar to the sounds of puppies playing, only about three octaves lower. What were they? He was sure they weren't dogs because they never fully put their weight on their front legs. They kind of touched them to the ground when they paused to look at me. It's hard to explain, but I could tell they didn't have normal paws in the front like a canine. They had more like a hand's appearance. The animals, whatever they were, 
were standing just beyond the edge of the outside lights of the vehicle. I finally came to the realization, he said, he stated, that this may be a mother and her pups. I've lived in the area around wild hogs and coyotes, and the last thing you want to do is get between a mother and her pups. The witness started the truck, which startled the animals. The smaller ones ran off into the tall grass, but the larger one moved closer. Just close enough to bring his head and front legs out of the grass where the witness could see it. He described it to Linda as having the look of a wolf with much more fur, almost like an Irish wolfhound. The eyes shined in the light like most animals do. They kind of had a yellowish green glow to them. The ears were pointed back so I could not tell their exact position on the head. I decided to leave at this point. Laid back ears are not a good sign. As I drove off, it decided to let itself be heard. I could hear it plainly over my truck and it was very loud guttural howl, sounding much like a wolf, only a lot deeper and more raspy sounding. As the figures came nowhere near to standing upright like a primate, the witness was sure they were not Bigfoot. When they ran across the road, he said, I could tell that the legs they ran on were like the rear legs of a dog, but with more girth. The witness has not returned to the area since the sightings occurred, nor has he been camping there. These animals were clearly big enough to be on the top of the food chain, he stated. Land between the lakes also has natural caves and numerous rundown structures from different things that were located there in the past. It would not be hard for these animals to find shelter way out of humans way. A breeding population of dog man, we already have noticed several examples of what could possibly be juveniles of this currently unknown species. Who knows? Somewhere deep beneath the hills and hollows of Kentucky, in the remote dark woods or in some long abandoned building, perhaps even an old church, an entire litter of dog men could be being born even now as you're reading these words. So there you have it. Uh, story about a dog man family. So, evidently there are natural, at least one type of natural dogmen out there that live and breed. So, just one more thing to worry about when you're in the Kentucky woods. So, if you guys like this video, please like and subscribe and share it if you like. And thanks for stopping back here with us again. And we'll be trying to drop some more videos soon. You guys take care. Have a great day.